I'm very happy to see all of you here. Uh, hello, dear panelists and uh, the hi, uh, the audience who are joining us in Zoom. And hopefully the Facebook Live starts soon. My name is Maya Kale, and I will be today's moderator at the wonderful event, uh, As Food As It Gets. But to give a background of what the project is about or what the conference is about and why we are meeting today, let me give floor to Eva Miltige the project lead of NetFork, to give the overarching kind of picture of where are we and why are we meeting today. Eva, the floor is yours. First of all, thank you, Maya, for, for uh, introducing. And also, uh, before I say anything else, I want to say big thanks to Maya because she was real, really the rock for me in uh, conducting this research. Uh, and uh, without her, it wouldn't be like this. So all of you have to know the role, uh, her role in all of this nice process uh, and the report that I will present in a second. Uh, so if we are ready to talk a bit more about that. I will share my screen. Uh, and uh, just so you know, I will not be able to see any of the speakers uh, or, or attendees uh, while I speak. So turn on the microphone if you want and need. Uh, so yes, today I will give a super brief insight in, in the project itself and the report that we did. So you understand why we are here. Um, and I am Eva Miltinje. I am a project manager at the European uh, Union projects. Uh, and uh, to understand the background, why, why it's me and why I'm interested in these topics, I've been uh, in non-formal education for almost 20 years, so since I was 14. And um, it really is a really, really close thing for me to understand how to work with people and how to facilitate different activities. Uh, and I am also the initiator, initiator of this network, uh, uh, which is a network for network. I'm sorry, <laughs> it's the beginning of project. I cannot say the word network normally anymore. Um, so initiator of network, which is, uh, let's say, yet informal network for organizations that work with food related facilitation methods. Uh, just so you have an impression about this project. Uh, so. How it started, it was a, a training session in, in Berlin a few years ago, and I shortly before Christmas, I had brought a block of uh, gingerbread dough, and one evening we were just baking those gingerbreads, the atmosphere was super nice, everybody was super happy and bonding, and then the atmosphere next day was completely changed, so in that moment, something clicked in my head, and I was like, hmm that could be super interesting to see what else could be done with food. And then uh, a few years passed, Corona started and, and that you know uh, also impacted lots of things. And um, uh, I was joined by two other organizations, by GNU International and uh, Youth Empowerment Center from Greece. Uh, and we applied for a project called Network for Impact, which is funded by the Erasmus Plus program, uh, and thanks to them, we are here today. Uh, super shortly, it lasted 16 months. It, lasts, it will finish end of August, and uh, our goal was exactly this, to explore and start discussion about food-related facilitation methods. Um, and uh, we ended up uh, creating this report. There will be a website uh, and uh, you can already see online interviews in our Facebook page and also this conference where we are today. Uh, so, yes, just to give a, that was just a brief uh, background information. So let's get on to uh, also a very short introduction to the report that we made. Uh, I hope that it, that you have read it before coming here today, if not then I dearly suggest reading it afterwards. Uh, this is a QR code, but you will also get the link uh, in email after the event. And you can see the link in almost every communication we make because it's really uh, important for us that as many people see it as possible. Uh, so the report is relatable, creative and barrier breaking, the power of food and facilitating activities for social impact. Um, Shortly, the 
process went on in a way that uh, we started the research around October last year and lasted until the April this year. It reveals different uh, social goals, topics, audiences, types of facilitation methods and facilita facilitation tools from uh, 27 countries of European Union. Uh, and what's really uh, beneficial for facilitators is the collection of 74 examples, including toolkits for different methods. And it is already available, available in English and Italian and as soon as days it will be available also in Greek and Latvian languages. Um, so what are the main conclusions? Uh, I will not go in very much detail and lots of lots of things that we found out because we of course we found out a lot, uh, but uh, you can read it yourself then later. But to remember, there, there are a few things uh, which are interesting and to keep in mind. Uh, so we found out that social impact through uh, food-related facilitation methods can be brought in, let's we'll say, three main aspects. One is the fact that tool is super versatile tool and it's tangible and it brings out different emotions and, and uh, senses in people. Uh, so uh, it can be used in different activities, literally like as a clay, like, you know, something very tangible and, um, yeah, uh, useful in the practical facilitation process. The second thing is the, uh, let's say, the uh, connections and the community that food brings, which is also a super, super strong and like one of the most prominent ways how uh, food related facilitation methods currently are perceived, let's say, uh, yeah, community dinners or cooking together or stuff like this. Uh, and also the third aspect is the knowledge. Uh, food is very connected to most other parts of our lives, uh, it, like uh, and almost any any aspect of our life we can tie to food. So uh, knowledge about food, where it comes from, how it's produced, and many other ways, um, is one of the like it's, it's the third of the ways how social impact could be brought to people. Uh, then we also concluded four uh, simple, let's say, benefits for, for facilitators how to go all, all about this. So the first one is food makes facilitators work easier because it helps reaching uh, less, uh, like audiences which are less easy to reach. Uh, it is delicious, it is engaging, it is fun, creative, and lots of other good things, uh, and uh, really can be a very good help for any facilitator. Second, food is a part of the solution. As I mentioned before, lots of our daily uh, habits and uh, and um, just daily systems in our, in our lives and in the community are connected to food. And uh, just changing some daily habit or things that we eat might actually be the solution. The third is that food improves well-being individually and collectively. It can help to for us to connect with ourselves, with our body. It can help to connect with a particular topic or a memory. And it also can help to uh, connect with the like community uh, and all of these aspects are super important in uh, modern days especially because the current society has one huge uh, problem which is disconnection and food can uh, improve our well-being through connecting uh, and then the last one food, food has an immense potential and attributes for innovation besides uh, the fact that it's creative in itself and, and uh, super versatile. Um, it also, let's say, is not um, explored enough, like food-related facilitation is a topic that has not been explored enough, but also lots of avenues on, on connection with different topics have not been even tried in food related facilitation. So it still has lots of uh, room for growth and, and exploring.
the last thing, super briefly, more from the, let's say, dry side, <laughs> Uh, what we found are the prominent topics, which are super used super much in, in the food related uh, facilitation activities, which is sustainability, culture and diversity and well-being. And the uh, most prominent social impact goals were integration of intercultural exchange, community building, food literacy and sustainability education. But that's just a super brief uh, introduction by me. Uh, what you can do is download the report, have a look, uh, have a look at the more like the whole document, and follow us on the network.eu Facebook page where we will post information, more information, more interviews, and other things in the topic. And of course, uh, go in the world and and create delicious connections and uh, and uh, yes, uh, use this amazing uh, tool to you know. Get, make the world a better place. Uh, mm. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much, Ia, for this very quick wrap up. So, uh, thank you for introducing the whole work you did together with your team. And just a reminding to those who are watching us uh, on Facebook, feel free to uh, post your questions there. We will read them and we will try to convey further them to the keynote speakers. And also here, feel free to post any kind of questions or comments you have. Uh, here in the chat. Wonderful. Now let me give a floor to Mikilis Grievinc, who is professor at Riga Stradinch University. And Mikilis had an interesting task as for the researcher to answer the question, why is youth work-related research lacking? Why are we lacking this type of research in academia? And how can researchers and scientists work more with such under-researched topics uh, and, and kind of have this link between youth uh, work activists and the researchers and scientists. So, Mitili, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I think I will, well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to, to actually share what we have been doing for the last couple of years. Uh, I have been given just 10 minutes, and so I, I will be fairly brief of what we are doing and, and what we have found out. Uh, but uh, to, just to, to quickly recap on what I will give my presentation on, I probably will start with saying, or try to explaining on how we have been dealing with uh, connecting food and youth. And then maybe uh, in conclusions, I will give some uh, insights on what we have found, why maybe some research fails and some research succeeds in uh, bringing together youth and, and food. So I have this fairly complex title of my presentation, but basically I could uh, give a title, just, just two words, case study, uh, because I will show you some things that we have done recently, uh, namely during the last three years, which is, uh, sorry, yeah. So during the last uh, couple of years, we have been trying to build this network of 40 uh, young food activists from all across Europe. Uh, with the goal to facilitate change in food systems. And uh, well, it, it is debatable, can we call it the best well, best case or, or best evidence, but in my head, it definitely is something to be proud of uh, because already now, just after three years, we see that uh, we have uh, managed to, to provide to a group of active people tools needed to facilitate change. We have been a ground playground where six uh, novel food initiatives have emerged from. And also we have just built a network that still functions. And while well, now we are trying to find a strategy how we are slowly giving uh, the more uh, bigger role to participants of the network, we see that actually sort of a normal network quite often just fails after the people who have set up the network leaves. And we see that it hasn't happened so far, so we are trying to move out slowly. And there are leaders who are trying to keep, uh, take the responsibility to leading this network further. So however, let's start from the beginning of why we decided to do that. And basically, as it usually is, it started with a uh, possibility to, to actually uh, attract a project funding, which said that there needs to be a change. Uh, well, if we want to receive this funding, we need to facilitate change in the food systems. 
And probably as all of you who have been working with food systems know, it's not such an easy task to facilitate change in food systems. Basically, food systems are an enormously complex. There are so many different actors engaged. There are so many different visions and expectations and, and sort of ambitions that it, it's, it's practically impossible to align those. And so while activists and researchers and often policymakers say that we need change, well, it's also very clear that not everybody equally benefits from change, well, at least immediately not. So not everybody will be really uh, willing to, to actually jump on the wagon of, of changing things. And the, the thing of systems is that, well, just you cannot change just one part. You'll need to change it all together if you want to achieve any permanent change. Basically, if you, if you manage that consumers change for, for one bit, but then you don't change how well, we, we sort of believe that consumers can change the system, but they are linked to, to basically all these other actors that also have to do some things differently to make sure that well change sticks and actually that it, it is possible for consumers to do something or for farmers or for producers or any group that's there. Uh, so, so understanding these difficulties, we thought, well, typical approach where we would just inform or would just create uh, guidelines for one group saying like you should do things differently wouldn't cut it we would need to do something differently and what we we come up with with this idea is that we have to build a network a network of, of very active people uh well mainly young people because uh, well as we assume well these people well obviously they are the future but they are those that quite often have uh less access to various instruments tools and resources also, they are those that are much more prone to, to change and, and have often already tried some new things. Uh, and, and we thought that if we could actually bring these people together, then we could give them the tools, we could give them the resources, uh, and they could, and together maybe we have a chance of changing something. Uh, so, so basically, we decoded this approach into five large challenges. First being that we need to find the right people it wouldn't be that just anybody would work. We would need somebody who shares our vision that things need to be changed. Uh, we need to find these people from all across the food systems. These cannot be just farmers or consumers or, or well, activists. There have to be consultants and then farmers and their people representing small shops just to make sure that there are different perspectives. And also to make sure that the, the things that I said earlier, that you actually have to make a systemic change to, to make change stick possible. Uh, so we needed everybody to, to make sure that we are actually talking to the full uh, whole system simultaneously. Uh, we had to uh, convince these people to actually work with us. And then once they jump in our wagon and, and say that, okay, we are willing to work with you, we had to maintain this trust and sort of keep on delivering in order not to lose these people. And, and there is one more final point, but that's behind your faces. So, okay, we have to provide the right uh, insights. So, uh, it's not just it's, it's not enough to create a network. It's it's the easy part to, to create a network. Uh, we still needed to provide tools and and cutting edge research uh, findings to make sure that these people actually benefit from the network and that when they leave the network meetings they are equipped to actually do something uh, on their local uh, uh, level that actually facilitates this change. So how we did it, the, the first thing was to, to find the right people. And basically I could split this task into three sub subtasks. One was sort of trying to find air, uh, well the most, most suitable people. Uh, so to do that, we basically uh, harnessed the, the resources within the networks we had access to, but also we reached out to all of the networks that are already there and said, well, look, we are building this thing. And if you have anybody who might be interested, please share this information with them. And, and that might be really beneficial to both, well, all of us. Uh, then, well, obviously it wouldn't cut it if we were, if we would look like we don't know what we were doing. So we actually hired professional uh, designers to, to develop all the materials that we have just to make sure that we look, that we know what we are doing. Because, well, change is good. And, and sort of everybody agrees that the change needs to be, you know, well, taking place. But if the person who is saying that the change needs to take place doesn't look like they know what they're talking about, 
probably you'd won't convince anybody. So, so looks are important. But then finally, it was also sort of making appealing proposal. And, and so sort of we needed to, first of all, oversell ourselves, but then also to deliver. So it doesn't work if just you just oversell yourself. Then you need to work your, sorry, ass out to, 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 to make these things work. And what we came up with, uh, and I will later on uh, comment on how we actually decided on these things that we can deliver. Uh, but that's a, what we came up was this uh, set of uh, uh, propositions, what we can offer these people who would join our network. And which is a place in the network, of course, we could offer access to people uh, who are leading experts in their fields from all across Europe. Uh, we could give the people um, some uh, possibility to impact how this network works and sort of to co-create it together. Uh, we could give them some visibility through network. And uh, finally, we could give them some seed funding that actually could be used to, uh, to, to develop their own ideas and their own uh, um, initiatives. So that was the first thing. That was what we promised. And I think that was what we delivered. But that's obviously not enough to make people uh, well curious. Uh, one more thing we we sort of saw that it's good to promise things that are related to, to their professional life, but that might not be enough. And then we said, well, let's make sure that we are having networks meeting in person from all across Europe. And let's sort of also have this traveling opportunity, which on one hand just sounds nice. On the other hand, it was really, as it turned out later on, uh, instrumental. Uh, because it helped these people to see different food systems in their local environment and also to, to grasp how same alternative food networks, alternative food initiatives work in different contexts and sort of opened up a perspective that, that food systems across Europe are not necessarily the same thing. So they manifest themselves in very diverse ways. Uh, so that was regarding creating interest, but then we also made sure that we constantly just uh, monitored uh, what what was on our uh, uh, network's mind and then so we, we sent out questionnaires just just to see well are we doing the right job and uh, so we ended up with having these uh, set of, of trainings all across Europe uh, where we basically communicated four main things that we teased out of the surveys that we were uh, conducting with the people that were in our network and and so what we learned what they want and what would help them was to that if they had a possibility for network so that we delivered automatically but that just said that any time that we organize the physical training we need to maintain a space for networking uh again might sound naive but people said that they really benefit from excursions so so we also anytime we had an in-person meeting we made sure that we have at least a couple of evenings uh, allocated to organize excursions to local initiatives and the possibility to uh, to actually talk with the person who does uh, did it. Um, Co-creation. So people said that they want support for their own initiatives, and we had the funds allocated. But but sort of, there was also a need for consultation. So we allocated constantly time for people just to to discuss what they are doing and sort of get these insights from others and training. So and that was the easy part. That was lectures where we just were showing what we have uh, identified as the most relevant new research happening and, and what new tools might help them to actually work on the ground. So in practice, it looked like that sort of, it, it had some lectures, it had some fun, as you see people doing some physical exercise as they do whenever they come together and then try to show who is, well, that they are having fun. And then some excursions where some people are really listening in and some are really, you don't see, they remain in the background really tired and just sitting in the boxes and already like fed up from all of the things. Uh, so that's it, that, that's what we've done. And as I said, it, it might be debatable, is it the best case? I gave my, my thoughts why I think it is. So now a couple of things where I think we gone right and what maybe are the lessons learned that could help everybody else also to repeat if they feel that this is something they would want to do. And, uh, and one was we very early recognized that we have this, this ambition that we have, it, it's really large and, and it might be hard for an institution from Latvia to actually build a network of ambassadors from across Europe. So we 
searched for partners from all across Europe and we ended up doing it in a network where we had a lot of people and we made sure that all of these people who were joining in uh, that they felt uh, that they are part of the network and they are part of, of the organizing team and they have the say so it wasn't our network it wasn't just our ideas it was everybody was engaged and I think that's what made it happen but also we gave a strong voice to to these young activists who came in, just to make sure that we are that they felt that that was their network, that they are willing to work on that, and that they actually get what they expect that we will give them. We did a lot of reflecting. Uh, we constantly, after every event, we sent out questionnaires and we monitored where we are, and it it just made our life so much harder because we constantly had to rethink how we are organizing things and rethink what tools we are giving but at the end i think it, it helped us to actually give the best tools and make sure that we are spot on constantly and finally i, I think quite often people just think that these communication activities come for free and no they, they don't sort of we we really allocate a substantial chunk of our funds just to make this work but making uh 40 people well, uh, covering tickets for 40 people to go across Europe for for, uh, for these events that was expensive, but actually that that can be budgeted and, and sort of if you do that, then it makes things significantly easier. Also, all the other activities they, they cost something, but if you sort of think a little and if you add them in the costs, it makes your life significantly life significantly easier, and then success more. Uh, uh, Sort of, you you just increase your possibility of actually being successful with what you are doing. With that being said, I would like to thank you once more. And if you have any questions, you can either write uh, me or you can raise them in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mikkelis. It was very interesting to hear, and especially I liked your kind of statement that you need to benefit from the network and how much uh, the learning in informal environments can take place. That's quite amazing if you think about it and why not everything is informal and kind of cheerful, right? And also we had some questions from the audience when they signed up for this conference and there was a question why this event is not in the offline environment, so to say. And it's just like really to reach everybody on board. So we have the attendance from all the um, Europe. But let me give floor to Paula. Paola Capodistria, she's a sustainability expert and actually quite a frequent guest in Latvia. But Paola herself is from Norway. And um, I will share Paola's slides. And meanwhile, I just want to say also hi to Gregor. Very nice to see you. Your speech is next. Well, let's listen to Paola first. Thank you so much, uh, Maya, <clears throat> and uh, thank you, uh, Leva. I, I wanted to say, but personally, I felt very, very touched. Uh, besides congratulating you for the report itself, I felt uh, very touched by the introduction of the of the report. Uh, so I wanted thank to thank you, you very much uh, for taking a trip through that again, um, and uh, congratulations on such a good project. And uh, thank you, uh, Michaelis. And I hope I'm pronouncing it well. For, for your presentation also. Um, my name is Paula. I'm going to be talking about some food-related facilitation methods in youth work uh, with examples from Norway and from Poland. Um, I wanted to start with the picture of this uh, potato. Um, you will, I will tell you a little bit more about my background soon, but um, Recently, when I was traveling, traveling among other places, uh, Riga, I, I heard that potato was a national dish in, in uh, Latvia. And uh, I was very surprised because it is also a national dish in Norway. And it is also a national dish in many other parts. And, but what I find even more funny is that it originally comes from South America, where I was born. Um, so I wanted to choose this particular ingredient and especially this, this particular photo because a lot of my work is related to food waste. And this is an example of a beautiful potato full of uh, love that sometimes unfortunately doesn't make it to the closest supermarket. And I thought it was uh, just a nice image to start um, yeah, giving you a little bit of insight about where I come from and, and my background. So you can go to the next slide, please.
Oh, we lost it. I'll share. Yeah, I'll share again because it uh, just uh, didn't move. Um, no problem. Um, I can just continue telling yeah, continue you. Continue, um, and I will try to jump. Um, as Maya said, I I am a food sustainability expert. My background is in uh, environmental and development studies and also agroecology, where I focus mostly in food system sustainability um, with a very uh, system thinking and action learning approach. Um, yes, I'm back. Um, most of my work experience has been in the, in the, no, you can stay in, yeah, mm -hmm. with me. Um, most of the experiences in the uh, Horeca industry, the service, the food service industry, um, but I've also been working many years uh, in the um, Federation of Norwegian Food Banks, uh, which I helped develop, and I also sit in the board of directors of the Federation of European Food Banks, where I'm also leading the governance committee. So a lot of my work uh, had to do with both environmental and social impact and most of it with uh, food waste and, and different projects and facilitation methods. You can go to the next one. Um, from the very nice report, uh, I wanted to choose these three aspects to give my presentation a little bit of a framework and talk to you about food as a tool, as a community builder and as a knowledge um, element in some projects that uh, some of them are being involved in and some others I'm just super fan of uh, and, and wanted to share with you. Next slide, please. So the first uh, project uh, will touch upon food as a tangible tool. This is a project called Compass Mat, uh, where the organization Compass, what they did is uh, to build up a business model where they uh, started with, with the youth, the uh, vulnerable youth population uh, from different sectors of, of the city of Oslo. And what they did is um, they have a slogan called, we see gold where others see waste. And this is because these were displaced populations that were at the same time uh, having a project with surplus food. For those that don't know what surplus food is, that is food that we produce too much of and that is risk in to become food waste. So if you rescue this food, you save it from becoming food waste. So this is what this group of uh, young kids did. And uh, no, you can stay in the first slide, please. Um, because I was going to show you on the right side of the screen, you can see there is uh, one of the projects they had was a food truck where they made their famous uh, falafel in a waffle. Um, they had to use a lot of creativity in terms of using the ingredients they got from supermarkets and, and local producers. Um, and then another project they had is on, to the left is they took over a school canteen. So they were involved in the daily operations of this, uh, this canteen. Uh, in that case, many of the kids that had been volunteering in the project were uh, eventually employed by the project to work in this canteen and do everything from procurement to customer service to cooking and cleaning. So um, this was, uh, of course, a very, very special experience for them. Uh, and uh, I, I would spend hours telling you about all the nice stories uh, that, that I picked up from, from the very nice kids that I met uh, during my, my cooperation with them. Next uh, slide, please. Um, for this project, um, I want to move to food as a social setting and to move to Poland. Uh, when I was working for the Norwegian Food Bank Federation, we had a um, cooperation project on behalf of the Active Citizen Fund, where we organized workshops and skill sharing sessions together, and we also visited each other. So in one of these visits, uh, specifically to the Food Bank in Olsin, we got to join a workshop that it was especially targeted to youth and families um, that were refugees from Ukraine, actually, in Poland. Um, and what was really interesting about this, uh, this workshop that I attended myself, so I must be in some picture there, um, we were three groups, and what they did is they placed uh, one person from Poland, one person from Ukraine, and one person from Norway uh, in each group. Uh, we couldn't really speak the same language. The Polish didn't know Ukrainian, the Ukrainians didn't know Polish, the people didn't really speak much English. So 
um, we really had to communicate through the food. So we had each of us had a, a task to make the appetizer or the main dish or the dessert. And we just had a recipe. And basically we had to start teaching each other how we call the ingredients in, in our own languages. And I don't know how that magic happened, but I can assure you that after an hour and a half or two of cooking, we were all like, you know, blah, 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 talking as if we all spoke the same language, which was obviously the language of food and, and love and, and being together. Um, so this was also a, a really nice experience that I, I know that the food bank uh, continues on doing. Uh, next slide, please. Um, another example of food as social setting is also a project that is very close to my heart and myself because it actually takes place in my neighborhood in Oslo. Um, it is called Le Kitrak. And it's a project of the Oslo municipality where, again, they involve youth to, again, rescue surplus food and, and, and make food out of it. They don't use just surplus food, but the main uh, point of this food truck is that it, it goes around the city a few times a week. It finds a place. Um, I think there's nothing more. You, you were talking, Michaelis, about how the element of a, a, a trip was uh, very attractive for youth. Well, the element of free food, believe me, it's also uh, an, an incentive for, for young kids. So what they do basically is just to place themselves somewhere where they know that it's nearby a school or nearby where there's youth hanging out. Um, and what is very special is that it's, this uh, project is in collaboration with social workers that basically come with the truck and hang out with the kids while they eat something nice. And it's incredibly popular, you know, you can follow it on Instagram to find out where the lucky truck is today. Um, and it's also a very nice way for, for the municipality to, um, to get a bit closer to understand more of the concerns and issues of the local youth. Next uh, slide, please. Um, now we're gonna move to food as knowledge. I have a little bit of a background as researcher, so this is also uh, uh, quite close to my heart. Um, the first, first project that I want to show you is uh, on behalf of MATVET, which is an Norwegian organization helping the food industry avoid and reduce food waste. And what they did is they created this um, tool which is called the food waste table, the mat kastabura, where um, they have tried to visualize the proportions of the different types of food that every single Norwegian throws uh, in one year. So you have the right proportion of dairy, of bread, of meat, and so on, on the table. So this causes a very strong visual impact when you see, especially when you think, you know, we, we usually tell the kids, well, this is what you throw, but think about your whole family. How many are you at home? This is for each of you. And this was an amazing conversation starter. So we would visit uh, different uh, fairs and exhibitions and events where we knew that there were other children or youth or, or, or young adults uh, that would be interested in, in, in learning more about food waste. And through food waste, we could start talking about um, food systems, food uh, security, poverty, and, and so on. So this was a, an excellent um, attention catcher and, and dialogue starter. Um, the next uh, slide. Yes, that is the last example that I have. I'm trying to catch up a little bit on the time since we started a bit delayed. So I hope I, I can manage to summarize. Um, so the, the last one, uh, the last example of food as knowledge is a school project that we did uh, in the Federation of Norwegian Food Banks in different locations. We have uh, in Norway, we have eight food banks in the country and three or four of the food banks were doing school projects. And these school projects happen in different ways. Either the kids come to the food bank, like you can see in the picture with all the kids holding the banana. Again, this causes an immense uh, impact to see the amount of food that would otherwise have gone to waste hadn't it been uh, rescued. Um, and can also um, trigger discussions about food sustainability, how our food system works, 
um, the social aspects, uh, food insecurity, poverty, and so on. So this was one model of, of visiting the food bank. But another model, like you see on the right side, is facilitators from the food bank going to the classroom, um, where they basically had discussions and different exercises, again, around the topics of food system sustainability, food waste, food insecurity, and so on. Um, if you go to the next slide, we can see the third kind of intervention that was that the facilitator would come to the school and would also bring some surplus food with them. So as part of the teaching day, this would, this would usually take place in the kitchen or maybe start in the classroom and then go, you know, where you sort out the ingredients and decide what you're going to do and then move to the kitchen. Um, and basically, uh, the kids were trying to learn to improvise with whatever food that they were given. Um, and again, we can link a bit of all of the other aspects of, uh, of food, not only uh, as the, the knowledge aspect, but also the community aspect and the tools. So I think that this, this project uh, has a bit of everything. Um, and what we did with this project, since we were doing, since each location had such different approaches and, and even each school, uh, could say what they prefer, you know, and sometimes it was better that they would just come and have a chat or or some others really wanted to go and visit the food bank. Um, so to take advantage of this diversity, um, we wanted to do some research on, on what did this mean? What were the differences between the activities? So you can go to the next slide. Um, what we did is um, two surveys, uh, one that we sent before the intervention and one that we sent after the intervention to try to find out what elements of the activity that they, that the, the, the intervention that they participated in were most attractive, got the most attention, impacted more, shocked the kids more. Um, I, I must say the kids were between 12 and 15 years old. Um, so what we try to do is, you know, you have to understand this is a bunch of people. I think the youngest was 30 and the rest of us were like well into 40s and 50s. So we had to try to make these as appealing as possible for the youth audience that was going to use this service. So we used a lot of smileys, as you see in there. We wanted to know um, how they enjoyed the visit to the food bank, what they felt, uh, what do they feel when they're throwing away food, what do they feel about the things they learned and so on. On the next slide, you can see also we have tried to use more of these emoticons uh, also to try to make it basically more relatable because you know these kids open TikTok and this is what they see every day. So we wanted to make it uh, a, a bit closer to their own culture. Uh, and on the last, uh, the next uh, slide, you can see that we try to even use different uh, emoticons to to show the feelings about this is specifically about what, how do you feel when you throw food away? Um, we don't have the results of this, unfortunately. This is still ongoing. I think the last school visits are this week and next week. So I hope to have more results about this uh, by the end of the year. Um, but um, yeah, and I also thought that these were some interesting examples. I'm happy to answer some questions. And I started, yeah, you can move to the last slide because I started with a potato and uh, now I made French fries out of it. So uh, thank you very much for having me in this uh, very inspiring uh, event today. Thank you, Paul. It was amazing to see your presentation, also how well you have structured according to the research, like tools, uh, knowledge, community, and all the various examples. It has been just really, really amazing. Thank you so much. And now uh, it would be weird if we had a conference about food uh, uh, without a chef. And that's why we have a Polish chef, Gregorz Lapanowski, and he is also working with kids. And he, we just throw, like, took him out of, of the lecture. He was in the middle of lecture, as I understand, Gregorz. But the floor is yours. Just and a as second, the, Gre yeah. uh, Gregor, can we test your audio just a moment? Yes, Please. yes. Hello, hello. Okay, okay. Thank, you, yeah. thank you, thank you, thank you. Wonderful. So the floor is yours, and Gregor will simply tell his story. Hello, guys. Uh, Nice to be with you, nice to hear you. Uh, so my name is Grzegorz Oponowski. Uh, I'm from Poland, uh, lived here for all my life. Uh, 
I got into food being 14, more or less, but uh, at these uh, 90s, I would say, being a chef wasn't actually something very popular. And so my parents weren't too happy that I want to do it. So I, I, I finished uh, political science and sociology uh, and then food safety, but still, I mean, food was always uh, something me and cook as well as it's possible. I just love to eat, uh, so I knew being a student that either I will get to know how to cook, either I will not have uh, access to high quality food because you need to spend really a lot of money for it in the restaurants. So I said, okay, then I'm going to learn how to do it. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I'm, I, will, I will tell you a few, uh, th there are two, qu two, two questions. I mean, how can we take food seriously in the education system? I think this is quite an important question. And then uh, I wanted also to share a bit uh, with you about my experiences working both with kids and youth and also school canteen chefs, parents, teachers, and also media. Uh, so, I mean, the reason I, I, I'm doing that is that being 19, I went to US, uh, to California, uh, Tahoe Lake, and I, I worked there as a cleaner, but... I had a lot to do with kids because it was a camp and then from time to time I had a possibility to cook also and I've been there for three months I did skating every day uh, more like something like 30 kilometers a day because it was a particular distance to the uh, nearest village 15 kilometers there and back and then during those th three months I got uh, about 10 kilograms more uh, 10 kilograms more, even though I was eating quite the same, like on everyday basis, and that I even did sports every day. So that was really crazy. So that was one observation. The, the other observation was I've never seen people that big, uh, uh, portion that huge, so many processed food. Uh, as I was working in, uh, in, in, in camp, there was also a canteen. So it was possible that one person could cook for 100 people because the uh, technology process was uh, defrosting ready lasagna, ready burgers, ready and so on and so on. And then I had this possibility to, to cook up there one day. Uh, and uh, since I cooked the meal from stretch, uh, one thing is that I needed like probably six to eight kids to help me up. It took me probably three times more time that to, to make it from stretch. And then so I think these uh, yeah. elements are really cru crucial to, to like to, to, to understanding the situation that we have nowadays. And then when I came back from there, I was still studying political science, searching for my way, how can I put it all together? And uh, also, I, I, three years later, I went to Great Britain. And what I've seen was like the, the market where in Marks and Spencer and many different shops, there was just an amazing valleys of ready meals, uh, ready meals that weren't actually so highly processed, uh, maybe uh, with all the additives and I've seen in US. Still, those ready meals like pork chop and potato puree or like ready salad, I was wondering, okay, so how, how long is the shelf life? I mean, how long can you keep it if it's ready on the shelves? And so how, how huge has to be a food waste if uh, all these things, they are ready and they are packed in, uh, in, in, in plastic? So, uh, yes, and there were also a lot of shops where you could buy actually ready meals. And also the, 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 the people, they were, they were obese. And also the diet of everyday people, because I've, I've lived there, I've seen the way they live, was uh, there was a lot of highly processed food where there was a lot of salt, a lot of frying, a lot of sugar, all those things that we know. And then uh, doing my master, uh, I, I did a master about food policy. Um, and I was trying to understand, I mean, is there any problem with the, with the system? With the that these people are obese or that uh, these people eat the food that I wouldn't name food, sort of like uh, Michael Pollan said. And at that point, I really thought that this is an issue of, uh, of a system, of a policy, of a regulations, probably the, 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 uh, someone, is, is someone who, who is responsible is, uh, is the industry. 
But today, I think that the, 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 this problem is way, way deeper. But then, I mean, uh, studying uh, political systems of uh, many countries, uh, I've seen that the data that actually one of the best intervention you can make to, um, to, to prevent obesity is a food addiction. And, uh, and since then, uh, I, I was, I was um, on my own, I, I came to Warsaw, which is the capital of, of Poland, and I actually didn't know that much people here. And then I remember from my home uh, that uh, my mom was cooking, my grandma was cooking, and that we actually didn't use processed food. So for us, cooking was a natural process. For us, eating together was a natural process. I mean, when we... Mm, when we wanted to meet with the family, the, the food was around and it was quality food. So, so for me, uh, this sort of relation building was connected with the food. And then during my studies, I've seen people who, who actually, you know, cook for their own. There wasn't really that much cooking. Uh, often it was reheating and then they eat on their own, watching TV or like looking at the, at the laptop. shock for me uh, but then later on in, in in Warsaw I sort of felt that I want to find more people like me more people that are interested in in food uh, and uh, in in sort of like using food as a tool for education uh, more or less at the same time I, I met uh, Italian slow food that was a really big inspiration for me uh, the slow food is as you know the organization that is promoting uh, uh, regional and traditional, uh, sometimes organic food that is actually supposed to be sustainable. So all this, I would say, intellectual and also spiritual uh, way of thinking about the food was, I would say, from a philosophical point of view, it was built up by slow food. But then Polish market was different. I mean, uh, after 1989, uh, before everything was was a nationalized, so so it was a, owned by government, a lot of uh, production companies and like you know bakeries and stuff like that, uh, cheese factories. But since uh, 1989, it was uh, it it was able, and so more and more of a private sector began to grow. But with that, it was a huge space for uh, external companies to get into Poland and actually to cheap the production uh, facilities for a really uh, low money. What does it mean from the, from the economical point of view is that uh, huge uh, international companies uh, had an actually uh, easy desert to like put their seeds and like to grow. So after years, there is a really a huge percentage of the food chains uh, like uh, Lidl, Biedronka, Tesco, Leclerc, and so on and so on. They really have a huge power on our market. And then, so, so, so as I was doing this, uh, this master's degree, I, I discovered that actually, as I told you, the, the best way uh, for the preventing obesity and overweight is uh, food education. So I mean, what does it mean food education? Well, what does it mean cooking workshops? Uh, then I've met the, the, the very known uh, chef in Poland who used to run cooking academy. Uh, and then and I did a practice up there. And at the same time, I met uh, a teacher from the kindergarten. It, it's a woman who is right now about almost 70. And she was the first person I've met who did a cooking classes for her kids in a kindergarten. And that was like, wow, for me. I mean, you can use a food as a tool to tell the story about the world. To tell the story about the fishes, about uh, about agriculture, about uh, mm, yeah, about different aspects of food production. Because many kids they do answer you that uh, milk is from the shop, or like cheese is from the shop, and the pro different sort of produce they are from the shop. They they've never seen farm. Uh, so uh, so yeah, I, mean, I start to work with her and I, uh, with her, and at the same time I, I got to the point that uh, I will not be able to do it on my own. I mean, I need more people, more more people that do believe that the, the change of a food system is needed, that we need to act together if we want to have an effect, and that is actually a nice idea that could not only build. Uh, also build that will be involved in the food in the food change so we, we started to build a foundation that was uh, responsible that, 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 that the key point of it was uh, promotion of culinary education through kids and youth uh, but our sort of a key point was actually really to in, 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 in improve the food system 
So for more than seven years, we did the classes all around Poland uh, for kids and youth. But suddenly, I mean, there is also there is always this question about the money. I mean, how can you get it uh, to to run the foundation? And you know, we were kids. 25 26 27 so we started to um to to build an organization and work with the with the with the food industry the companies that we thought that they are ethical and like that they produce a nice quality produce so we asked them if they can help us to both to do the uh, classes for kids but also to build an education platform that could be an universal tool because i mean when you do cooking classes it's for 12 people for 20, sometimes for 30. But then if we think about the scale of, of the need that is on the market, I mean, we need to make it for a million of kids in Poland. So this this, this scale is huge. And so so we, we decided to actually use the tools that we are using, like scenarios, researches, uh, all the methodology and the, the logistic ideas. How can we share with this knowledge with other people, with the teachers and the culinary educators? all around Poland that would like to use our tools to do the same what we believe in. And during a few years, we built an education platform that the scenarios were for free, recipes were for free, knowledge was for free. And uh, we got in contact with more than two and a half thousand teachers from all around the Poland. So it's, I would say it's something like maybe 20% of, of all the schools in Poland. Still being back then an organization for the money from the power sector. So this was a sort of a, a fuel for us because this, this, this discussion with the business is quite easy. If you show them numbers, give them an argument, uh, maybe, maybe the director of operation or director of the marketing can help you in, in, in doing something like that. Of course, the, there is a cost also. I mean, it's not that, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, we are, we are addicted in, in a way to the business. So, so it's, not only, it's, it's never like sort of a free relation. Uh, of course, uh, some uh, also sourcing of the money we got from the, we got from the, from the governmental institution. Bit difficult to operate because you need to do the reports and so on and so on. I can tell that you know. It. And yes. then you, your, mm. inter your internet connection is a little bit unstable, so we have some kind of breaks in between your speech, but uh, we can get the major idea anyway. <laughs> I think, yeah, just, just letting okay. you know. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry for that. Sorry for that. Maybe mm. you can go somewhere around the corner and you catch better or not. What do you think? Mm -hmm. But anyway, it's fine. You can just continue and also just uh, probably wrap wrap up uh, as we were late a little bit. But yeah, uh, thank you. It's, thank it has been super, super interesting. And and while you are moving, I'm just reminding everybody, you now it's your time to write in the chat the questions wherever you are so that we can take the question and answer session right after the Grigor's talk. Yes, the floor is yours again and let's hope for a better. Okay, thank you. Uh... Yeah, so 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 we did this for 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 quite a few years, and an interesting experience also to build this uh, education platform. Uh, yeah, and maybe maybe the experience of working with kids and working with youth. Uh, I do believe, and I've seen it, uh, that actually kids and youth uh, they like a manual work. They like action. They like uh, a sort of uh, our education when you need to sit on the bench and like read a book or listen to some teacher that is speaking. Uh, I think the move is something that is um, that is just natural for us as a human beings. So actually sitting in a class for uh, like six or seven hours. It's something that for many of us is boring, but this situation of cooking together and action is something. And then, so that's one part. Then the other part is, I would say from the organization point of view, it, it, the, 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 the important thing is, uh, uh, is preparation, an idea about what we're going to do the classes. Either we do it about water, either we do it about breakfasts, either do, we are doing it about uh, fishes or meat or sustainability or it's always good to like get the subject, make a good research, make uh, points, uh, like sort of scenario, 
this uh, the theoretical part, it's supposed to be short uh, because uh, many kids, they cannot concentrate for a longer period of time. So I would say introduction can take us depending on the age, five to 15 minutes. And then we have this practical part. That's the, the methodology that we used to use. So always combining theory with practice. And then this practice also supposed to be really well organized from the logistic point of view. shouldn't take more than 45 to from half hour to to one hour it's i would say uh, a good amount of time uh, for cooking for us kids in school canteens you can even if in, in, in from the kindergartens it even can be 10 to 20 minutes because what what they need is more like doing it regularly than doing one huge event once a year that is actually more than event than uh, education so then doing it systematically um, works and also give both small kids, but, uh, but crucially those or maybe 12 or even uh, more, this practical skill which cooking is. Because looking at nowadays market, I mean, and also nowadays uh, lifestyle is uh, um, there is so many ready meals. There is so many like they call them solutions so it where we can eat easily and quick and cheap that, that that this cooking skill we may feel we don't need it but but then i mean if we really want to eat healthy food uh, and if we want to eat food that has less salt less sugar uh, uh, less white flour uh, less fried it is easier to make this on our own because all those techniques and ingredients that I, that I said, I mean, they are actually helping both uh, gastronomy industry and also food industry, making food more delicious, more delicious, and even more delicious. But that's, I mean, the other side of a coin, the more delicious it is, the also often less healthy it is because it's sweet, sour, fatty, uh, where there is a lot of uh, Maillard reaction, which gives us a crunchiness and, and a beautiful uh, flavor. So uh, it is sometimes easier for us to cook on our own to have this healthy result than go to the restaurant for ramen that is going to be way, way salty that the dietitian would say it's good for you or for me or for us. So, um, so yeah, this, this, uh, this cooking workshop, it is worth to like organize it really well and to also have a skilled uh, person that is going to run it. But then, uh, like maybe trying to put some conclusion, I would like to get back to this um, in governmental solutions that we actually need. And this is a nice change through last 15 years that we actually more and more, I would say, understand that we need this change of a system and also change of education and change of the governments that would understand that um, food education is also an education for the sustainability in the future. Because if we do not have a knowledge about the, the influence of, a, of a food production on the climate, on the biodi agrobiodiversity, on the, um, the, the safety of the, of the boundaries that, that this world has, I mean, we, we really need this knowledge. And uh, of course, uh, it's not only about cooking. Mm, so, so what we need, I feel, is like the change in the school canteens, in, in the change in the in the school in the school shops, uh, more education for the people who are gonna cook in the school canteens, but also uh, a, a thinking about how can we put this logistic even more efficient. That, for example, supplies maybe uh, ten schools for five thousand people so that we can control the cost of a food production and maybe control the quality of a production, but also uh, because it's more uh, expensive to, to run a school canteen in every school. I mean, so all those questions we need to address, but, but also what we need to address is that, okay, if those costs of a culinary education, they are so high because they are like cooking workshops or like even giving better food to, to the kids or maybe some organic potatoes, maybe some organic onions, maybe some local produce. But all those, I mean, mm, yeah, we need, to, we need to rethink if this investment 
investment is worth or we better choose saving on, on, on education and on feeding and then have these problems that we have nowadays with obesity, overweight, and more than 200 uh, illnesses that are actually connected with the, with the better food. So I'm sorry for the connection. Uh, uh, just, just putting a dot at the very end. I, I, would, I would like to say that I do believe that uh, this change is possible and we really need more and more people that are convinced about that. But we also need to remember, I think that, that this wave of the history is, uh, is what we all experience, like this sort of McDonaldization process uh, combined with, with, with the globalization process all around the world. And that this blue of the, of the history and culture is, is actually how can we make food even more cheaper, even more accessible. <laughs> And so, so this role of, of education is important so that we don't look at the food only from the business perspective, but also from the environmental health and also relation perspective. So thank you so much, Gregor. It was very, very interesting talk. And also you kind of answered this bigger question, why? Why do we have to work with this? And you nicely sketched also this legacy or heritage, how it goes and how we kind of end up where we are. And you, you really illustrated well these processes, but most importantly, why? Yeah. And then the, the question why is somewhat answered. And the, then also uh, your, how you started your speech is how uh, do we take this um, um, food seriously in education? The more like a broader sense. So well, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you all panelists. And now it's a question and answer time. Let's take it now before the break. Uh, and then we will have the, after that 10 minutes break. And after the break, we will then meet you attendees in a breakout rooms and we will have chance to talk more closely and build together this recipe that you hopefully will base on the inspirational keynotes you heard today or maybe the research that you've read. But now in case you have a question, you can type it in the chat or, or uh, type it uh, or write us an email, uh, whatever is more uh, or convenient. Raise a hand. Or raise a hand, that's all is possible. And while we are waiting for questions, I will ask, yes, Gregor, you want to say something? Yes, please. <laughs> I, I just wanted to add maybe one more thing that uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, being in US, I, I thought that this is the problem of a system and the problem of uh, a technical problem, a problem of food and, and, and logistic and organization and so on and so on. But uh, 20 years later, which is today, I'm, I also like see that this is also an emotional problem and a spiritual problem. That uh, uh, food is an easy way to feel better for a few seconds, but it is. And then I think that uh, in nowadays society, we use so much social media. The, the lifestyle is so uh, far from the natural uh, rhythm of, of the way we're supposed to live. I mean, slower, more on the, on the, on the fresh air, more using, using our physical power than our intellectual power that actually a lot of us sitting, being bored, uh, being actually tired of not doing anything and scrolling so much social media that we have those uh, dopamine drops and lows. Food is an easy way to feel better for a few minutes. So I think a lot of us, I mean, we sort of um, forget, I mean, that food at the end of the day is supposed to be a sort of a, petroleum or like oil for us who are living and that this it is meaningful but it's also only food so if we start to search for feeling better using food to feel better i mean there is this risk that uh, uh, we we will pick this easy way to feel better forgetting mm -hmm. that, uh, that yeah there are many many other ways to mm -hmm. to like uh, yeah just to feel good Mm. So, so today, I, I think that this is also a big part that this is a problem of a relation, but uh, maybe sometimes faith uh, that uh, food is important, but it's also not the solution to feel better. And yeah. in some, some kind of uh, 
cases food is the visible part of the iceberg and there is much much uh, yeah. deeper underwater that we have to discuss where we are heading uh, in this globalized and uh, mcdonaldized world as you were mentioning and uh, what do we why we are doing that so thank you so much this is very very good to kind of intermezzo and add on to your speech uh, how about you uh, paula now you have been working also with food for quite a while and do you see that there are still more things you want to dig into when working with this topic or or do you think you also want to go maybe broader like gregor about mental well-being and, and how that kind of interacts so what, what are you going deeper or wider in your in the scope of your work I think that, like you said, um, food is the tip of the iceberg of so many other issues and, and conditions in our global food system um, that I think that it will become more and more relevant through the time um, because from food, and this was very well described in the report as well, you know, you can relate food to absolutely everything. And I like the, the example of this uh, bread therapy very much. Um, I, I agree with with what um, you were saying about the what um, um, I missed your name now, um, Gregors. You were saying about the the risk of food and, and you know used as a pleasure replacement and stuff. But but food is also uh, a very important emotional component in interventions like the ones that we're talking about, especially with vulnerable populations. And and I really like what you mentioned about the link between food and sustainability, because um, I do think you were kind of uh, asking, Gregors, but I think that um, that food education really will contribute to um, a more sustainable food system, because we really just need education and skills that are very important to, to continue on having. Um, and I think that 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 the, that is very difficult, especially in the urban uh, settings, to deal with healthy diets and access to food. There is, we see a lot of inequality of the access to food. We see a lot of this uh, junk food and ready meals that Gregor was talking about everywhere. Um, and we need to, to create more of this food space. We need to make it because the reason why we ended up here efficient and comfortable and at the end of the day managed to pick up the kids from the kindergarten to go to a doctor's appointment and maybe she buys some carrot snacks in a plastic bag and yeah it sucks but at the same time we live in a system where we are rushing all the time where we have a lot of things that we want to do and i think that we should try to yeah maybe strengthen that value necessarily have it as something that is available all the time and really create those spaces so that you can yeah celebrate food but you can also access healthy food so i think that I've, that is definitely an area that i would uh, i think that that urban food systems are extremely relevant these days especially because more and more people are going to be living in cities and as i said it's impossible to go out and find a healthy option if you are on on a rush in a rush so looking more into like the creation of food spaces and food availability in cities i think that is uh, definitely something we have to put more attention on mm. thanks paula uh, and you, uh, Mitchell, is uh, how are how are your kind of through the research that you do, and also partly teaching at the university. So, what do you think is the next uh, big thing, especially if you look at the food as a method in youth work? Well, I think well, first of all, this isn't so much a question about research results, but about philosophical beliefs or, or where we should go. And I, I think that uh, there is definitely a space for the opinions that has been expressed in, in the future food system. And, and so we, well, it's, from my perspective, it's important to have this debate. And although not necessarily I agree to everything that has been said, I think it's important to have this discussion. So if I have to give uh, my own perspective on how I see the future or our relations with food, I do not necessarily agree that we should 
move away from seeing food as something uh, pleasurable and, and good. I think the main challenge is that we are expecting that this pleasure will come cheap in terms of we won't have to pay for it and it will come very quickly. And then we turn to, to very low quality food that creates all the problems that was described. But then once we start to realize that actually the quality of experience with our food have to be cultivated, it, it means we need to allocate time to think how we actually get the best products, how we actually cook the meal. But then also we have to develop our senses so that we don't need this crazy amount of sugar, that we can enjoy different well, diversity of tastes that there is. Then sort of, I, I don't see that it's, it's a problem. It's just that people need to be much more conscious that they that it cannot be just wiped under the rug, that you have to think on what you are eating. And then when you become more conscious, you have to actually, you, you can't start to improvise and can't start to do many things. Because I think as, so if you just first uh, regard food as a functional mean, mean, you forget of what Paul was saying, like, like uh, that the social significance historically food have had, like uh, building relations and just being together with friends and it's, it's so important and i think there there is this one author in anthropology saying that you are truly lonely when you are eating your meals alone and i, I completely agree with that like like sort of it's if you start to see that you don't don't have anybody to eat with is it's you have probably problem but then also for for me it's a reflection that inherently food will always be a so well in societies it will be always social experience and i think we shouldn't lose it like we should uh, eat together and then and together explore well, how it can be something good and tasty. But then we also have to think about how we are preparing the meals, how we are getting the uh, products and what is done with waste. We just need to be more aware of that. That's a very politically correct answer, saying yeah, everything and nothing. But, Sorry. <laughs> But, but also, and you have prepared to answer the question, no, you, but just a very quick insight when the people uh, applied for this conference and they had to answer the question, what role does food play in your work and life? And then many of them said, like, we want to know more. We want to think more about that as it's such a daily activity. And then there was also such beautiful quotes as that's a source of inspiration, happiness and relaxation. So maybe it's not just a corrective, but it can be really a creator of happiness. And, and then it's um, lots of people work or try to work with the topics of food waste and research and 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 really it feels like there is not yet a very strong formal networks where the people can actually join in and share this knowledge like we are doing here today and then from this perspective yeah maybe the concluding uh, words uh, to whatever question you would like to answer <laughs> from your side uh, well uh, I, I i don't have any any questions but uh for me, I just want to would say, hmm, say that it's really, really nice to see so many people actually sharing this idea that food is important. And maybe for each of us, it's a bit different. And maybe for each of us, it's a different way how we, you know, for us as people working with social impact and working with people. It's a different way how we bring it to others, but uh, it is a topic and we cannot deny it, you know. And uh, I'm really happy that, you know, the spark of idea together with people baking gingerbreads a few years ago has turned into something that really actually uh, sparks way more ideas and, and connections now today, but also while well, reading the the report, as Paula said, or in other ways, hopefully online and in the future. Uh, and uh, for me, the only, let's say, uh, concluding <laughs> words could be like, um, let's not stop at this and, and, and make it, make it, make food and food as a tool and, and uh, activities with food, uh, more diverse and uh, let's use it as a, as a great tool to to change something in our societies. Mm. Uh, and, um, 
yeah thank you very much thank you eve and thank you all the panelists and you will not believe but exactly for the next session now we will have break but what we will do in the next session together with attendees we will exactly uh, discuss three topics more in depth so climate and sustainability perspective that is one that was mentioned here frequently then we will talk also about mental well-being that uh, Gregor, you mentioned uh, mental well-being body image and food so this perspective and the third one will be uh, the digital tools digital concepts within food related facilitation as we are gr growingly living in a very digitized world and also now we are meeting online and we have to somehow make the best of it what we can from these kind of new tools as well they interact with food and as was mentioned already before that whenever we go online we see so many bright pictures of unhealthy food right so so there is lots of things to do or as paula mentioned and showed that you can communicate very well with young audiences through emoticons so this is emojis and kind of so yeah um this is what we will do after the break but i would like to cordially thank you dear panelists for for joining in for sharing your insights if we receive some kind of questions uh, from audience later in a written format, I hope I can I can reach you and, and, and you can answer it afterwards in writing. And thank you for your time, for your effort, and please keep evangel evangelizing uh, the food as a method for youth work. I think we need stronger voices here to be heard and, and to, to, to realize that we actually have already the first very important very important um, resources to use. And that's that research that the was mentioning and telling in the beginning. All right, with that, thank you so much. And, and we meet here uh, in 10 minutes. Now it's just a break to stretch your legs, uh, drink tea or coffee or, or whatever you want. So yes, see you in 10 minutes.